about how things are going with the Colombian peace process. Oh, we're starting in 4321. Okay, now we're live. All right. Well, um, and we're okay with the, the visuals and everything. My screen suddenly did something strange. Apologies, this is a new platform for me, but we'll trust that we're in good shape. And thank you everyone for joining our session today to get a bit of an update on how things are going with the peace process in Colombia. Today you'll be hearing from three panelists, Henry Ramirez Soler, Jenny Neme Neiva, and Lisa Haugard, who will be sharing from different angles about the current situation. And I'll be our host for this session. I'm Sarah Henkin, a Presbyterian minister and mission coworker, serving with the Presbyterian Church of Columbia as a companier for peace initiatives, diaconal service, and sustainable development. And I'm originally from Los Angeles. I've lived in Barranquilla for the past 10 years and worked with the church for a number of years before that as well. Um, today, we would love to hear your questions and comments. We don't have the option of opening your microphones, so please make sure to take advantage of the chat function or the Q&A to send in any comments or questions that you have along the way, and we'll be gathering those so that we can respond to them. And before we begin with our first panelist, I'd like to also give a bit of historical context to the Colombian conflict and the current peace process. For those of you who are already familiar with Colombia, you understand why we've titled this workshop Partway There. Things have finally begun shifting in a more just and life-giving direction in Colombia after over 60 years of armed conflict. But much remains to be done in order for peace and justice to become a meaningful reality for all of Colombia's 52 million people. Although many people in the global north commonly imagine that drugs are the cause of the Colombian conflict, in reality, the root cause is inequality. This has been the status quo in Colombia since before its independence from Spanish rule. And by the 20th century, many of the common people of Colombia were ready for a change. In 1948, the assassination of presidential candidate Jorge Eliezer Gaitan made it clear that the powers that be would not allow traditional politics to provide the avenue for that change. And by the 1960s, insurgent groups formed, such as the FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, and the ELN, the National Liberation Army. Unfortunately, decades of conflict and turmoil fell especially hard on remote territories, and forced displacement actually helped to increase the concentration of land holdings in the hands of the small, wealthy class of Colombians. Around 15% of the population of Colombia has been internally displaced since 1985. These are individuals, families, and entire communities who have been forced by violence and threats to leave their homes and start over in a new place. The armed conflict also left victims of murder, kidnapping, disappearance, and other crimes, bringing the total number of victims to 8,775,884 unique individuals, according to figures published by the Truth Commission last year. In 2016, during the administration of Juan Manuel Santos, the Colombian state and the FARC insurgent group signed a historic set of peace accords. They include many important elements to pave a road toward a just and lasting peace, a ceasefire and disarmament process overseen by the United Nations, a special justice system focused on judging crimes related to the conflict, land reform seeking to address the unjust distribution of land in the country, a plan for political participation for FARC ex-combatants and a response to the drug trade, including an end to FARC involvement in trafficking and new government programs to facilitate voluntary coca crop substitution and support for viable economic alternatives in remote regions where coca is grown. Special care was taken to prioritize the needs of the victims of the conflict and provide restitution and to provide for the particular costs of the conflict borne by Colombia's ethnic communities. Over 100 indigenous ethnicities, Afro-Colombian and Raisal peoples, and a small Roma population. However, the government did not allow the economic model to be part of the negotiations, and many essential elements of the 2016 Accords remain to be fully implemented. This is in large part due to the politicization of the Accords and a lack of will on the part of Iván Duque and his party, under whose administration much of the essence of the Accords was chipped away. Today, Colombia's executive branch is led by President Gustavo Petro, 
and Vice President Francia Marquez, who have been in office for eight months, and new efforts for peace are underway. And with us today, we're grateful to have Henry Ramirez Soler to share more about how things are going. Henry is a Claritian missioner and human rights defender who accompanies victims of forced displacement and their families. Originally from Bogota, Colombia, he has lived the past four years in New York, where he's a member of the Claritian team at the United Nations headquarters and follows the Colombian peace process at the UN Security Council. So welcome, Henry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I want to share uh, with you uh, about the total peace. I share the screen. Okay. Okay, what is, uh, what is this past total, total peace? Uh, so, it is a Petrus administration public police that aims to dismantle multiple illegal army group simultaneously online previous approach of individual isolate and this contextualized process in the third. Total peace is based on the concept that human security look for guaranteeing the right to life, socioeconomic well-being of Colombians and protection of the nature environment. Peace in this uh, moment, 22 groups, army, army groups are looking to join the total peace policies. But what is the point important for uh, understand uh, the peace, uh, the total peace Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Okay. Uh, for understand what is uh, total peace, uh, total peace have five points. The the first one is implementing the commitments made in the 2016 peace agreement with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia FARC. This uh, peace agreement have some uh, five people, uh, five points. Uh, the one, rural reform, political, uh, political participation, end of the conflict, solution to the problem of uh, illicit drug, agreement on victim, implementation, verification, and endorsement. The second one is uh, dialogue with the National Liberation Army, ELN. This process have six points. Participation of the society in the construction of peace, democracy for peace, transformation for peace, victim, uh, End of the army conflict, general plan of execution of the agreement between the national government and the National Liberation Army. Uh, we have another uh, second group, uh, Movimiento Revolucionario del Pueblo. He won, uh, join this uh, process. The ELM processes have three cycles of conversation. The first one is in, uh, was in Venezuela. The second one is, uh, was in uh, Mexico. And the next is in Cuba. The government 
negotiation team include former guerrillas, business people, ranchers, social organization, state-based organization, human rights defenders. This team is very, very diverse and include. The third is Caesar fire mechanism and dialogue process with far dissident Estado Mayor y Segunda Marquetal. Temporary oversight, monitoring and verification mechanism of the ceasefire between National Government and uh, EMC FARC. The mechanism is made up of delegate the high uh, of a uh, high commission for peace in colombia uh, minister of defense public forces the far uh, delegates this uh, mechanism is accompanied by uh, the map oea the inter uh, american uh, organization for the human rights uh, the UN verification mission observer and the Catholic Church. Uh, two delegates, the World Council of the Churches, uh, is invited but uh, uh, not yet uh, included in this, uh, this process. Uh, the Segunda Marquetalia have the intention to submission to total peace policies. Cesar fire and dialogue to be determined. Four, uh, this uh, two part with the uh, um, LN and uh, AMFAR is, is a uh, polit politic, political uh, dialogue but the four is with the other groups. Submission to law for no political narco-paramilitary groups. The objective and of the criminal act by criminal organization through to a strategy. A stranding of investigation and prosecution Collective, collective submission to justice by this organization. It doesn't create act of impunity or political agreement. In this uh, slide, uh, we can uh, see the different group and the the, the region after a. Uh, I send this uh, presentation for looking the information. The the five point for the total peace policies is national agreement, regional peace dialogue, develop meeting looking for solution of community problem. <laughs> regarding violence and peace. <coughs> Challenges. In the case of the Chotas and Spartans in Buenaventura, mediation through the local Catholic bishop for the ceasefire has been achieved between the two groups with which has led to a reduction in homicide. The presence of multiple actor, army actors in the same region make it very difficult to follow up and monitor the Caesar fire. Petro's administration has invited the war Council of Church to accompany, accompany the peace process. The representative who accompany this process are Humberto Martin, the Argentine, 
Methodist Church Secretary General of Wanaki Network of Protestant University in Latin America and the Caribbean. Goodwill Ambassador for Sustainable Development for the ACT Alliance, Global Organization of Protestant Churches Working in Humanitarian Response, Develop and Advocacy. Fernando Enz, Brazilian of German origin. Pastor of the Mennonite Church, representative for the Peace Church Theology Center at the University of the Hamburg, professor of theology and ethic at the Burge University in Amsterdam, member of the World Council Church Executive Committee. The, the plus or the more important challenges is the CISA fire. Several groups have expressed their willingness to cease fire, but in the practical term, it's not happening. Only Estado Mayor has following through. With the Gaistanista Self Defense Force or Golf Clan, El Clan del Golfo, the ceasefire has broken because it was not fulfilled. And Petro's administration ordered to reactivate the persecution against this group. The UN Security Council has continued to support the peace process with FARC, to accompany the dialogue process with ELN, Estado Mayor and Segunda Marquetalia. The UN Security Council and the UN followed up mission with accompany the political dialogue process. The criminal groups, the governor should autonomously care all the process with these groups linked to drug traffic. Because this is the big... Uh, discussion in Colombia, because many people have uh, the problem with a mix uh, in the, the same process, the political group and the criminal group. But peace, total peace, made the difference for each process. Each group have different process, different table for dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, uh, give me this uh, opportunity to the share uh, with you. Thank you very much, Henry, for your comments about the context of total peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll hear now from Jenny Neme Neiva, who will share with us about the situation in Colombia's rural communities. Jenny is a consultant for the Ecumenical Peace Platform, DIPAC, and is the Colombian coordinator for the French Colombian network, Vamos por la Paz. He's a member of the Mennonite Church of Colombia and a member of their Peace Committee, residing in the hometown of Bogota. And Jenny will be presenting in Spanish with interpretation by Alex Gaitan, who is a Clarician Minister at the UN headquarters, as well along with uh, Henry. Bienvenida, Jenny. Bienvenido, Padre Alex. Thank you very much. Todo tuyo, Jenny. Muchas gracias. Disculpas que no podía quitar el. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to unmute, unmute myself. Eh, muchas gracias por la oportunidad de participar en este conversatorio. Thank you for the opportunity to be participating in this conversation. Eh, y eh, quisiera complementar algunos eh, aspectos que ha mencionado Henry. Y lo hago un poco desde mi papel eh, en la participación en escenarios eclesiales. 
I would like to add to what Henry has said and uh, exposed to you today. Uh, I, I want to do it from my role in the ecclesial um, community here in Colombia. Eh, yo soy miembro de la Iglesia Menonita en Colombia y nuestra Iglesia ha tenido una vocación de paz y ha estado muy cercana a los distintos procesos de paz en el país. I belong to the Mennonite uh, Church here in Colombia, and it has been a dedication, a vocation of this uh, church community, faith-based community, to peace uh, in Colombia. Eh, desde este escenario también eh, se ha apoyado la creación de espacios, red, eh, como el diálogo intereclesial por la paz. From this uh, scenario, uh, we have been creating a support uh, group, creating spaces for peace uh, and dialogue. El diálogo intereclesial por la paz, Bipaz, es una red que eh, ha reunido a iglesias y organizaciones eclesiales. Eh, se creó en el 2014 para impulsar de manera más decidida las agendas de paz y en este momento sigue viendo como una oportunidad de incidir en el actual gobierno colombiano. Uh, this, uh, uh, the past is an interclassial uh, dialogue for peace as uh, made out of uh, several churches, several faith-based communities. It was created in 2014 and it's, it was created especially to support the peace agenda and the peace processes in Colombia. Desde este escenario y también tengo la posibilidad de eh, acompañar desde otros escenarios varios procesos territoriales y observo que hay eh, unas situaciones en los territorios muy complejas. Uh, I have had the possibility to uh, be participating in accompanying the uh, several dialogues in the territories, especially the far areas from the big cities. And I have been, as an observer, uh, seeing the difficult and the uh, complexity of the situation for peace in these territories. Historicamente, las zonas eh, rurales, especialmente, son las más golpeadas por el conflicto armado y las diferentes formas de violencia. Historically, the rural areas are the ones that have been uh, basically more. Um, suffering the consequences of uh, the, con the armed conflict in Colombia. They had been, in some cases, devastated completely. In los últimos cuatro años, eh, se ha exacerbado, se ha aumentado la violencia en los territorios y hay una gran crisis humanitaria dado por el asesinato de líderes sociales, el alto reclutamiento de niños y de niñas, y en general situaciones de violencia en, en muchos territorios golpeando mucho a los pueblos étnicos. In the last four years, the violence has increased uh, in um, high rates, especially creating a humanitarian crisis because of the uh, assassination and persecution, constant persecution of social leaders from the rural communities in uh, the recruitment of underage uh, or minors, and also the um, um, invasion of the ethnic uh, territories, that means uh, uh, indigenous people's territories. Afectación también hacia las mujeres, eh, el fortalecimiento de los distintos grupos armados eh, ha hecho que las mujeres continúen como botín de guerra y sean eh, violentadas de manera continua. So women have been also victims, uh, a great, um, we could say, targets, great targets uh, in the strengthening of the armed groups. And they have been suffering the consequences uh, in a high uh, percentage too. Y que en este momento, con el, digamos, el anuncio del nuevo gobierno de impulsar una política de paz total 
muchos de las, de las comunidades y de los territorios ven esta como una gran esperanza, una gran oportunidad de cambio. At this uh, actual moment, uh, with Petro's administration, the actual government in Colombia, and the total peace policy, many of these groups that had been suffering the consequences of the armed conflict in Colombia, they see this policy as a great, with great hope and expectation that uh, life is going to change in their territories. De los grandes pedidos de las comunidades. En, en este proceso, en estos nuevos procesos de paz, en estos nuevos procesos de diálogo, justamente tiene que ver con garantizar la participación de pueblos étnicos, de mujeres, de jóvenes en estos diálogos y preferiblemente en los territorios más afectados por la violencia. So the requests from these communities in front of this policy and, and this new process is especially guaranteeing the participation of um, the women's, women that had been victims, the indigenous uh, communities, uh, children, and all the most vulnerable factor, uh, uh, sectors in, in the society in Colombia. Y un segundo aspecto que considero eh, muy importante, eh, el pedido de las comunidades de avanzar en diálogos humanitarios de manera paralela a los diálogos formales con los distintos grupos armados, sobre todo buscando la protección de la vida de la gente en los territorios. So in the second request, uh, in, in this process, it is important for, for us to uh, see that the, um, there are also simultaneous uh, dialogues, not only with the big uh, guerrilla groups, but also with other armed factors or armed groups in the area. So we could uh, look for this peace in all stages. Diálogos humanitarios son diálogos que hace directamente la comunidad con los actores armados, buscando hacer acuerdos específicos para el respeto por la vida de la gente y la vida del territorio. Eh, y es, al, so es una solicitud que hacen al gobierno colombiano que sean avalados y permitidos estos diálogos. Uh, humanitarian dialogues are between the community and the armed groups. So uh, the common um, the common goal is to protect life and make sure that life is possible for these communities, especially in the most vulnerable areas where the state or the government is not able to protect life. So to in in instead of uh, regarding uh, like just uh, staying with the government only, they they really want to protect life and make everybody involved in the, to this process of peace and dialogue. Eh, mi exposición y espero que podamos conversar eh, más. This would be my last uh, uh, intervention and I will hope that we could uh, talk and have a, a Q&A afterwards. Muchas gracias, Jenny, and thank you, Alex, for interpreting for us. Thank you. I'd like to remind everyone that the Q&A option is there, as well as the chat, if you have comments or questions that you'd like to submit for any particular panelist or in general about the situation in Colombia, uh, we'd love to receive those. And now I'll introduce our final panelist for this session is Lisa Haugard, here to share some thoughts on U.S. policy and Colombia's peace process. Lisa is originally from Philadelphia and serves as the executive director of LOG, which I'm sure is familiar to most Advocacy Days uh, folks, the Latin America Working Group out of Washington, D.C., where she's worked for many years in a variety of capacities uh, pre previous to being executive director, which from the website looks like you're in your 30th anniversary year, Lisa. Is that right? Congratulations for such a long haul and really important work that we really appreciate uh, LOG's advocacy and education efforts. So welcome. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so uh, the U.S. government has a lot to answer for when it comes to fueling the conflict in Colombia. And in fact, um, 
uh, of the 9 million victims, many became victims, um, whether of forced displacement, uh, extrajudicial executions, um, or other hor hor horrifying forms of violence. At the, during the high water mark of U.S. military aid to Colombia, um, and that's that's the truth. Um, but I'm actually not going to talk about the negative impact of U.S. policy at the moment, because I'm going to talk about how the U.S. finally came to support the peace and how important it is that the U.S. continue to do so. Um, the decision by the Obama Biden administration to support the the development of peace negotiations that ultimately ultimately resulted in the 2016 um, a, a peace agreement between the FARC guerrillas and the Colombian government. That support by the United States was really fundamental um, to the success of the agreement. Had the U.S. opposed the agreement, it probably would never have borne fruit. Um, and, and this basically um, uh, allowed um, the largest guerrilla force to finally demobilize. Um, so um, the the kind of support the U.S. gave was to to appoint an envoy to the talks, who really helped to give the Colombian government and elites the sense that they might be better off supporting peace peace accords and not opposing them, and also gave the the, con the guerrillas the confidence that they would not suddenly be extradited to the United States and live out their lives in, in U.S. jails. Um, and U.S. financial support to peace accord implementation was also fundamental. Um, just to give you some idea, um, your tax dollars and mine have gone to support, um, well, they went to support the war. I didn't like that. Um, but but in the last um, in the last uh, um, seven years or so, they have gone to support the tripartite transitional justice system in Colombia. Um, they have um, uh, backed processes with victims that have resulted in hundreds of reports on the human rights violations during the conflict being delivered to the Truth Commission and the transitional. Um, justice mechanism and the commission to locate the disappeared. Um, but also the, U the U.S. government has supported land titling, funding to Afro-Columbian indigenous communities, um, and much else that is really good. Um, so it's a complicated picture. And But right now, we're asking the U.S. government to understand that peace has not been consolidated in Colombia. Yes, the 2016 accords were an enormous advance, um, but um, they were never fully implemented. In fact, the previous Duque administration was really not very invested at all in implementing the accords and did so in a very um, partial way. Um, and um, and now we have the and and then there are all of these other conflicts with with other groups, the ELN guerrillas, the various uh, more paramilitary narco um, groups that that Henry was talking about, um, and the FARC dissidents, the ones who didn't demobilize. So you still have all of this conflict going on and affecting the communities that were so deeply hurt by the the, the conflict with the FARC. Um, and and the conflict with the, their own arm, their own armed forces, the violations committed by their own armed forces, and the paramilitaries that collaborated with them. So um, we now have a real opportunity that we're trying to convince um, our government to take advantage of, and that is there is uh, there is as others have referred to, there is um, the Petro administration um, has come in um, with a real strong commitment to implementing peace and creating peace and constructing new peace. So so. The new government is really committed to implementing the 2016 accords and then is involved in this really ambitious project. And I think you got a sense of that from Henry um, and Jenny of, of negotiating with all of these various armed groups in different ways um, in uh, with, with the with the groups that are more uh, that are sort of the narco um, groups in a in a much more limited way but with the with the remaining um, guerrilla groups uh, in a in a negotiation process um, so um, so we we need to convince our government to back this um, and right now I would say the Biden administration is not opposed um, but it's not real invested in it either it hasn't said yes yes they're interested in continue consolidating the 2016 accords, but going beyond that is the question. So what we're trying to do is to get um, President Biden to really get behind 
a number of things. First, implementing the 2016 Accord in a serious way. That means the land titling, the, the rural reforms, the ethnic chapter, the different kind of better drug policy that actually works with the small farmers. Um, so we're, we're real, this is a really once in a lifetime opportunity to consolidate the 2016 Accords, which will lay the basis for all the other uh, accords with, with gorillas. Um, and, um, and, uh, um, and then second, I'd say we really want the Biden administration to pay, play a special role in implementing the marvelous ethnic chapter of the accord. The ethnic chapter, um, it not only involves Afro-Colombian and indigenous groups in building the peace, but also in, in being part of the life of the, of the nation in a way that they always should have been. Um, and the, the Secretary Blinken, our Secretary of State, had, had made a wonderful statement saying that the United States was now going to accompany the ethnic chapter. Well, that's wonderful words. We were so delighted to hear it, but we need them to figure out what that means <laughs> and to really put political as well as financial support behind implementing the ethnic chapter with ethnic communities um, and organizations. Third, we are asking for support for the negotiations with the largest remaining guerrilla group, the ELN. Um, and these, these uh, negotiations are advancing, and we want the US government to name a special envoy to those talks. Um, and um, and uh, after President Petro recently visited and met with last week with with uh, with President Biden, and after that, the National Security Advisor on Latin America um, indicated that the U.S. government is open to appointing an envoy to the process once it moves forward more. So we have to um, keep keep pressing on that, but it's good to hear that there is some openness. Beyond that, we're going to see. Um, and I think uh, we want we want our government to be open to the idea of this more total peace process that Henry went into and, and Jenny went into. Um, it is confusing. It does seem like a lot is going on at once. Kind of understand the U.S. government sort of being like, well, let's see. Um, and it is important that the that the drug trafficking groups are treated differently than the ones that have like the guerrillas with historic roots, in, um, uh, uh, sort of a some kind of other rationale for 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 being um, than simply drug trafficking. Um, and that those processes are distinct. But that is the intention of the Petro administration. So we want our government to have an open mind about ways that the US government can support this more broad piece. Um, uh, so if you're talking to your member of your, your congressional office, your member of Congress about, about Colombia in the, in the next few months, um, and you need to understand a couple of things. One, um, Congress doesn't understand this. As a matter of fact, you now have more information um, than, than um, man, many members of Congress have about the total peace process and the efforts by the Petro administration to expand and consolidate peace. So you have valuable information to, to share. Um, second, there is a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to um, President Petro from some members of Congress um, because he Many, many, many years ago, he was a, a, a former guerrilla of the M19. He's been in political life. He's been mayor of Bogota. He's been, he's been member of Congress. He's been part of civilian political life since before 1991. Um, uh, and and they sort of see him in the kind of Maduro, you know, Venezuela, Cuba side of things. But he is a um, his government is a, a center-left coalition called the Pacto Historico. It's very rooted in democratic traditions, um, and it also has a really high percentage of, of um, high-level officials who have strong, who come from the human rights community and have a strong human rights background. So this is a, this is a, a, um, a social justice government with a strong um, human rights and democratic process background. Um, and um, so anyway, be aware of that. Um, and, um, and I would just me also mention that we are worried that, um, that, uh, 
the US government, the Congress will not fully fund the implementation of peace. And we want to make sure um, that that implementation of the 2016 accord continues. Um, so we want that assistance um, for peace accord implementation through USAID. We want to encourage the Biden administration to support the ELN negotiations, negotiations and we want them to have an open mind on, on peace. Um, so um, I think I need to wrap up here so, uh, so that we have a moment for questions. Um, but I would just say that what you can do as you move forward um, and with uh, thinking about what we've talked about this, this workshop, you can share this workshop. We'll have it available um, with your place of worship, with your, with your community, with your friends. Um, uh, you can sign up for the Latin America Working Group Action Alerts because if there's a congressional letter or there's a particular piece of legislation that you can get your member of Congress on board, um, we will tell you about it if you sign up, and that should be in the chat. Um, and um, I and just uh, if you do see your member of Congress or congressional office, advocate for consolidation of peace in Colombia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that helpful look at U.S. interests and involvement <clears throat> and how we can encourage that to be more positive uh, than it has been sometimes in the past going forward so that we can continue to consolidate peace for Colombia as a global community. We do have one question we've received. Uh, it's for you, Lisa, from Valentina Zuluaga in the chat. You can see, uh, but I'll read it aloud. Is the Petro administration looking for economic aid from the U.S. government in implementing the peace accords and total peace? Do you think Colombians should be skeptical of U.S. foreign aid to Colombia, given the shared history between the two? Great question, Valentina. Um, I, I think, I mean, I understand the skepticism, but, but um, the, the U.S. has been providing some very positive aid for peace accord implementation since 2016. Um, uh, including direct uh, funding for Afro-Colombian, not through contractors, um, of Afro-Colombian and indigenous communities, um, support for the land titling process, direct support for the Truth Commission, and the and so on. And and the, yes, the Petro administration is looking, to, uh, is asking for continued um, support for um, that kind of peace accord implementation. I have no doubt that if further accords are reached, um, that the Colombian government will be asking. What and would appreciate more kinds of support for the U.S. Uh, from the U.S. government um, on uh, uh, specifically USAID um, in in implementing accords that that come out of that. Even the the sort of temporary humanitarian accords that are constructed um, with communities that Jenny mentioned they need they need um, they need economic support for them to become a reality. Um, so I, I understand the skepticism, but I think that in this kind of U.S. support can be really helpful. Thank you so much. And I think we are actually at the end of our time pretty much anyway, and that's the end of our questions as well. So thank you so much to everyone who's been attending this time and this conversation for the hearts and minds and care for Colombia, to each of our panelists, Jenny, Lisa, Henry, our interpreter, Alex, and to Anna, who's helped us coordinate behind the scenes, thank you. And uh, now I'd like to close us in a word of prayer. God of peace, thank you for this opportunity to focus our hearts and minds and our dreams and peace among your people in Colombia. Thank you for the privilege to accompany people and communities who continue to stand up and struggle for that elusive promise of peace with justice. Thank you for teaching us how to imagine that peace is possible the lion shall lie down with the lamb, and no one will hurt or destroy on your holy mountain. Keep each of us alert to the opportunities we have to help your peace in Colombia and around the world. And guide us to your passions. Thank you very much. Blessing Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Oh.